evening, everyone. Welcome to our live broadcast. Today we're looking at uh, the Buddha's teaching on beings who are few and beings who are num numerous. Types of beings that are common and the types of beings that are rare. Um, it, well, the numbers, if you're if you're following along, it's number three thirty-three in the Book of Ones. It points very much to the idea of the Buddha's teaching being gradual. And not gradual in the sense of plowing along, doing the same thing, but gradual and gradiated in the sense of going in stages. In many ways, we're looking at the Buddha's teaching as a series of stages. What it means is the practice that you begin with is not the same in nature as the practice that you end with. And the practice at each level is going to be subtly different. And, and this, is, it goes, this is true in many different ways. For example, in meditation, you, you will again and again solve uh, a current issue that you're dealing with, whether it be one of the hindrances or some experience that you can't uh, bear with or that you can't um, understand. And you, you're unable to, to figure out. And then you get it and you, you come upon a, uh, means of of interacting with your experience that frees you from the suffering. And it's easy to become complacent and you know, you easily then move into a state of, of, of complacency, thinking that you figured out the problem. And so you, you behave... Uh, or you, you enact the, the same behavior uh, consistently. So you then practice uh, as, as though the problem were still there. And so the next problems are the same. And you find that the solution or whatever it was that you did to fix your problem, to... to, to cultivate a smooth meditation practice is no longer working because the situation has changed and your mind is is ever shifting and reality is ever shifting doesn't it doesn't just mean that the objects are changing but the very foundation of reality changes and it changes as you change so as you progress as you become what one might call more spiritually advanced the challenges change. The only thing you can really count on is you're always going to be challenged. Which means that when you, f when when it, when you become proficient, you know, when you overcome a challenge, the best thing is to expect for the next challenge, a new challenge, rather than than uh, rejoice at having figured it out. There's no figuring it out because it is ever changing, and 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 not not even in the same way. So it changes in new ways and, and becomes in 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 a way more challenging as you get deeper. The deeper and more subtle it becomes, you know, the, the more um, core issues, more core are the issues that you deal with the more substantial and deep-rooted. Uh, 
I mean, another way of looking at the gradation is in terms of the training. So you start with morality, you go on to concentration, and then even in wisdom, in the training in wisdom, there are many layers to the wisdom. You know, we have these 16 stages of knowledge that one goes through, and they're not the same. So during a meditation practice, you'll see you go through clear and distinct stages. Of course, they're going to be, and um, it won't be exactly clear cut, but there will be clear cut distinctions where your your state of mind one day to the next is not the same. The game that you're playing is not the same from day to day. The very rules, the very foundation of what you're doing. That's why mindfulness is so important. It's so important to have something that grounds you because there's nothing that will ground you. The experience won't ground you. Even your own state of mind won't. So if you don't have a way to relate objectively and be flexible with what comes, they easily take you off guard. So this this chapter is uh, one way of looking at the Buddha's teaching in a graded sort of way. It's in terms of there being few people. So he starts off by he gives a um, a successive list of a successive um, distinction between those people who are many and those that are few. And what this is really, I suppose, designed for is to help us understand how rare is the opportunity that we have. Because, you know, forget about coming to practice meditation or even listen to the Dhamma. The Buddha starts by saying, you know, not even being born human, you know, forget about even being born human. The number of beings, he says, that are born in water. The number of beings that are in a... And I suppose the meaning here is in, in a state where there's not much potential for spiritual practice. It's not so much the water as it is the state. So if you think about fish or you think about... Uh, crustaceans, squids, all these beings, even uh, insects, insects, many insects born in water, mosquitoes. Think of these types of beings. There's far more of them. And that, and that means something because the idea is that all of those doors are still open to us. As long as we, as long as we cling to samsara, and as long as we have ambition and desires, the potential to fall so low as to be born a mosquito larva in a pond somewhere, far more likely than to be born even on dry land. And far more likely even to be born wherever than to be born as a human, of course. Far fewer humans than there are other beings in the universe. Or on earth, you know. But even among human beings, he says, hard to find a human being who is born in a place where they can hear the Buddha's teaching. He talks about the middle provinces, the Majima Padesa, which is the place where Buddhism was uh, flourished and while the Buddha was still alive. How many people, simply by virtue, probably all of us, simply by virtue of being born in the wrong place, never had a chance to meet the Buddha, never had a chance to meet one of his great disciples. Even today, how many people, just by virtue of their stat status in life, their, their position, their, their place, are unable to come in contact with spiritual teachings, with the Buddha's teaching. Of course, 
nowadays we're we're quite lucky, you know, to have. You have to say we're lucky to have like the internet and to have such vast amounts of vast potential for uh, knowledge and dissemination of teachings. But this is very rare, even if you consider that now it's very common. This isn't, this isn't going to last, you know, this has only been what, 20 years, 30 years, 20 years. And it's certainly not going to last long into the future. So we have this brief window where now all across the globe we have the potential to learn about the Buddhist teaching, to learn about anything, you know, including good things and bad things. We have this door open to us. And so then he says even more than that, well, but even still, even for those who have the opportunity, few are those who are wise, intelligent, astute, able to understand the meaning of what has been well stated and badly stated. More numerous are those who are unwise, stupid, obtuse, unable to understand the meaning of what has been well stated and badly stated. No sugarcoating it there. Most of us are just too stupid to understand the Dhamma. I, mean, I guess that's something you don't want to be uh, boastful about, but there is a sense that all of us here are somewhat uh, blessed with wisdom. You know, let's sort of toot our own horn and uh, remark on how lucky we are to have the inclination. I mean, because objectively, even though you don't want to be proud, objectively there are many people out there, many, many, who would look at it, the idea of finding happiness in other, other than uh, sensual pleasure or, or indulgence, the idea that you could somehow just be happy rather than having to seek it out in things that are impermanent. You'd find that uh, incomprehensible. You know, just uh, unable to, to fathom it and would deride it and ridicule the, uh, ridicule the practice of meditation. Very hard to find people who even find meditation interesting or, or like a positive, to be a positive practice. You get, get that it's more than simply uh, blissing out or you know, finding an escape to reality. He says other things that I've already sort of gone through. To hear that, to see the Buddha, to hear the Dhamma. Rare are the people who get to see the Buddha and hear the Dhamma. But even those who hear the Dhamma, rare are those who actually keep it in mind. Far more are those who hear the Dhamma but don't keep it in mind. This is true. You can give talk after talk, but... much more common for us to forget the teachings and it's much more common for there are far more people who listen to your talks listen to the teachings of the Buddha uh, and then put them aside and live their lives as though they'd never heard such profound and wonderful teachings And here's perhaps the most, the most well-known one and, and one that I quote often. It says, few are those who, few are those who acquire a sense of urgency about things that are worthy of, of inspiring urgency. Sangvajani yesu thane su 
and things that are appropriate to be, uh, that are bases of urgency. We're going to get old, we're going to get sick, we're going to die. Greed, anger, and delusion are a cause for suffering. And they have power, the mind has power. These are, these are things that should stir us to, uh, to action. Very few people are, are stirred by these things. Mahasi Sayada likens us to ducks and chickens. If you look at these chicken farms, the chickens cluck and the ducks quack. And they live as though their lives were long and blessed with happiness. They fight and they play and they, they live as though they're in heaven. And they don't ever think of the fact that they're going to be slaughtered. They don't realize, they're not aware of their fate. In humans, we are very much the same. In fact, humans are even worse because we know we're going to be slaughtered. We understand that death is coming. But we ignore it or we avoid it. We shun the concept of death. Anyone who talks about death is considered to be morbid considered to be depressing. Well, carpe diem, as he sees the day, what we really mean is forget about the truth. Ignore the reality of our situation. Pretend that it's all going to work out happily ever after. It's funny, we have all these happily ever after stories. And there is no happily ever after. It's just old age, sickness, and death. They don't have to be depressing things, but there are things that should inspire urgency because if you die in the wrong way, if you die unprepared, if you die with a bad mind, if you even die you know, with a confused mind, which, which is very common now, right? We're put in hospitals and given medication that confuses us and we die in a muddled state. It's very common. We've lost our sense of urgency about these things. Of course, we've lost our understanding that there's anything to be urgent, to, to be distressed about at all. And we don't have a sense even that when we die, there's anything after it. We don't have a sense even that our minds are efficacious. In the sense that everything is random. It's a very common thing to, you know, luck of the draw. And our, our mind has no bearing. We have this idea that not even an idea, but we don't realize, we don't get, we aren't awake to the fact that our minds are so important. That there's nothing worse than an untrained mind. There's nothing better in the, in the universe than a trained mind. But then he says what, what, I, what is most interesting and, and clever is that even among those who are inspired with a sense of urgency, very few of those people actually do something about it. Actually, yoni so padahanti. Yoni so padahanti. Strive carefully, wisely. Do something about it. How many people think it's a good thing to meditate? How many Buddhists? You know, how many Buddhists in the world, or non-Buddhists? I'm always approached by people here in Canada, telling me how much they think, how great they think Buddhism is, and how admirable they think it is. And there's a sense that they would never themselves actually undertake to practice it. There really is a sense that what they're saying is that, wow, you know. Good on you for doing something useful. I mean, perhaps there's the idea that, that there are many different paths and they look at Buddhism like a flower, something to be admired, but nobody wants to be a flower. It's just something beautiful. So they don't, they don't yet have the sense of urgency. But among Buddhists, there is this sense that you know, there are things that need to be done. There's a sense even of fear of, 
of the bad effects of karma. And yet, it's so easy to make excuses not to do something about it, to not ever actually get around to bettering ourselves, striving for that which is worth striving for. All right, so I'm going to stop it there. The Book of Ones is probably not all that, it probably doesn't feel like it's all that deep in terms of uh, elucidate, elucidating the teachings, but because it's just ones, right? Once we get into lists of threes and fours and fives, You'll see there's far more depth and meat to it. This is more pithy sayings, much more quotable, I would say, these ones. The one this, the one that. This, that last one was quite quotable, if you, if you get the wording right. Few are those who are stirred by thing by, few are those who are stirred by things that are stirring. Far more are those who are not stirred. Few are those who, stirred by things that are stirring, actually undertake to uh, do something about it. And find some poetic way of saying that. All right, so let's move on to questions. Robin's here. Soti Bhante. Good evening, Robin Soti. We have questions. Sorry, I lost it. Bhante, I would like to know if your meditation center accepts male devotees from Australia to reside at the new center for short term, like three months to learn to meditate dharma and helping out at the center with daily chores absolutely that'd be great it'd be great to have someone come and stay and we can't have probably more than one or two such people but um, we could use someone who would be willing now the thing is a you have to be practicing uh, our teaching our technique so you have to be clear that this isn't an open center we're all practicing in, in one tradition uh, two, you have to do a full month of intensive meditation before you actually... I mean, actually, meditators here now, because we don't have a steward, are, are doing a lot of the things, household things, on, the, on their own. Um, so you would be doing some things around the house, but there would be many things that we wouldn't want you to do until you'd done a full month of practice on your own. Um, but, but certainly... You know, apply for a course and come and practice let us know that you want to stay on longer and uh, we'll try to accommodate if you have a chronic physical condition that affects your quality of life and if you get drunk and listen to music that inflames your temperament in an empowering and inspiring way and as you're experiencing the rush of the energy you turn your gaze upward to the sky and you stick a gun in your mouth and kill yourself, what happens to your soul or karma or consciousness? Do you go to hell? It's got to be the most bizarre question I've ever received. I think you get an award for that one. Well, it's very specific. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a... Uh, did not see that coming at the end. <laughs> uh, suddenly stick... Why would you suddenly stick a gun in your mouth and kill yourself? Are you suggesting like maybe a better description would be you're you're in a state of inspiration as you say and then suddenly you die you're you get in an accident which is actually far more likely that you're in a state of of you know what someone might call goodness or you know some sort of greatness and um, and then suddenly is is struck by lightning or 
gets in, in a car crash or something. I mean, there's a couple of, if that's what you're asking, then uh, there's a couple of points that I could make. The first one is, um, oh, I see, but there's more to it here, right? So your your life is is really terrible, and then you do something to uh, remove yourself from that situation, sort of uh, distract you from that situation, and then you kill yourself while you're distracted, thinking that your mind's going to be in a good way. I get it. What a what a you know it's it's like trying to trying to uh, weasel your way out of real what out of the law of karma really. You you can't you can't outrace the mind. You know you you can't and you can't escape the mind. Your intention to kill yourself. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood it at first. But your intention to kill yourself. Uh, dooms you. You, you, you. you can't escape that. Because your reason for killing yourself is a uh, inability to accept reality, your reality, your experience. And so, um, there's nothing you can do to, to mitigate that. I mean, maybe mitigate, yes, um, but you can't escape that. And by mitigate, I mean if you were to do some meditation and then kill yourself, rather than just killing yourself first, then yes, it's arguable that your mind would be in a better position. You'd kill yourself in a more peaceful manner. You'd be um, more peaceful about it. But it doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't get you out of the fact that you're um, making a conscious decision to uh, run away from your problems, which never ends well. Running away from your problems is never a good thing. Um, and and even more so, the other point I wanted to make is that getting drunk and listening to music is not going to cr cultivate a state that Buddhism would consider to be in any way wholesome. So this state of inspiration you're talking about is a state of intoxication, more than just the alcohol. The state of intoxication with um, really just pleasure and, and bliss and, and energy, you know, the, the, the adrenaline high or the, the chemical high that you get from the exhilaration of, of uh, liking, you know, enjoying life. But it's an intoxication, and you know, at best, that intoxication leads you to be born again as a human. But in this case, when you're drunk and really co coming off of a de depression and aversion to the pain, when you kill yourself, you put the gun in your mouth and kill yourself, the mind that reacts to that violent state that is suddenly quite painful, even for just a moment, and disturbing, if they couldn't handle the chronic physical condition, you know, the pain that was, you know, not life threatening, how could they how could they possibly be expected to handle the bullet going through their head and react in a positive manner? They're certainly not gonna react to it thinking, wow, this is inspiring and empowering. Right? They're gonna be horrified by the results, by the resulting loss of of power and, and ability that comes from it, the confusion of no longer having the use of one's physical faculties. So there's a lot more to your question. It's not the, 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 the solution you're providing is, is far from, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not really at all viable. I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, and by the way, you should, if you're really interested, I would recommend you try to read my booklet and, and meditate with us. It looks like you haven't done any meditation on here. I don't know if you're doing your own meditation, but um, you might, if you do practice, you might uh, get a better understanding of 
how the mind works, hopefully. I think. I mean, I don't mean to judge, but um, it does make, there, there's sort of a sense that uh, if you were to look closely, you'd see that I mean, getting drunk and high on life is not going to mitigate the actions that you perform. Thank you, Bhante. I miss your talks on the Dhammapada. Can mm. you continue teaching this? I feel yes. very inspired. Yeah, sure. Not this text. <laughs> These ones are not inspiring, huh? Mm. I think he's saying he feels very inspired by your talks on... Oh, maybe, oh. It, maybe it does say not this text. I thought it was on, on those texts. No, this text? Uh, we have to clarify there. Do you think this, these texts are not inspiring? These talks I'm doing every day are boring, dull, uninteresting, or do you just are you solely referring to the Dhammapada? Yeah, People it like might stories, be. you know. I mean, that's it's not all that interesting to me because they're just stories. But you know, they may, people enjoy them and it's good entertainment. But it's the hard teachings that we need to. Uh, medicine not candy but I know I've had this talk I've had this talk with many different people and everyone argues how useful and how helpful the Dhammapada is I think it is too I think the stories really stick with you you know and they mm -hmm. they provide a good um, just a, a good frame of reference for remembering the teachings I think how yeah, can I learn good. How can I learn about the more advanced meditation technique without going to a monastery? Well, you could do one of our online courses. That's what that's for. I've been to teaching people online. So there's a meet, you see the meet, uh, the word up at the top that says meet. You can click on that and figure out how to sign up for a slot and then how to call me and we do a video conference. That's one way. Yesterday I had a conversation with a friend and he told me something that I couldn't digest. I felt all the defilements taking over me. I tried letting go of feelings by acknowledging and controlling my breath, but it was a very difficult task. Any advice on how to deal with such a heavy load of emotions acting out all at, all at the time in a moment? Well, I'm assuming you've read my booklet on how to meditate. If you haven't, that's a good place to start. But you know, it's it, it's it, it is quite common to lose sight of what is actually being well, what, what, of the actual meditation technique. What we're actually trying to do, we're not trying to control the breath. We're not trying to let go of feelings. But uh, you say by acknowledging. Um, don't worry about letting go of them. Don't worry about controlling your breath. You see, controlling your breath is not at all useful, as you can see. Um, there's no, you know, th there's no solution. You can't solve things. You react, and that's the way the mind is is going. You can't stop that. The only way you can be free from that is if you, over time, learn that that's not the proper way to react not just intellectually, you don't want to react that way, but you have to teach yourself through observation, repeated observation, and, and uh, intensive and continuous mindfulness. And you're eventually able to, to really get uh, on a visceral and, and deep level that where those defilements are not proper way to deal with things. That's the only way. You can't just turn them off and let them go. You let them go eventually once you see, and that's why meditation is so important. And so this is something that should probably be an impetus to stir you to practice more strenuously, because you can see the danger. You've got 
like a tank full of gasoline and all you're waiting for is a match and when the match comes you explode. Is taking a human birth the result of merit that was earned in a previous life or lives? I mean, yes, yes, it's, it's a sense, there's a sense that the only way you can be born as a human is if you've done, uh, if you've, you've got a, a, a wholesome mind, you've got a mind that is well composed. You, you, it's like, uh, if you're, the only way you can get to the top of Mount Everest, not that being a human is like that, but the only way you can get to the top of a mountain is by being physically strong. In the same way, if you see someone born a human, you have to know that the only way they could get there, there's only the only way possible to get there, because they had to do it on their own. The only way to get there is through wholesome mind state. What is merit exactly? From what I can tell, it is a Mahayana concept. Is it just another word for good karma, or is it different? Yeah, well, merit is a translation, fairly poor translation of the word punya. Punya means goodness, or um, yeah, goodness is probably the best translation. And literally, the the I don't know what the etymology is, but the etymology they give us is that which purifies you. Anything that purifies you is is goodness, is punya. Um, it's not Mahayana. It's a, is it actually real? It, it refers to good karma. It just means um, anything that is based on a wholesome state of mind, any act or speech or even thought is based on a wholesome state of mind. That's punya. The opposite is papa. Papa means evil. But they translate it as merit. It's, it's a pretty awful translation, really. How did it get over the past life, the past life of friends, no matter how dark it was? Can we consider them as bad friends because of their wrongdoings in the past? Yes. Yes, you should be very careful about such people. You should try not to judge them, for sure. And, of course, be aware of your own uh, aversion and anger and frustration with them, sadness about them. But... Um, at the same time, you should be careful not to associate too closely with such people. Uh, I don't think you necessarily have to completely get over it. You can forgive, but you should never forget. I don't think. Well, you may, yeah, sure you can, but it's in your best interest to not forget, I would say, because you just pretend, you know, and by forget means doesn't actually forget. It means, you know, treat them as though it never happened. I don't think that's really proper because it did happen and it's a sign of something. And if, um, unless it's clear that they've changed, chances are they're going to do the same thing again. You don't want to be an enabler. You don't want to be someone who allows people to make the same mistakes again and again. So, and you certainly don't want it to affect your own practice and keep you from purifying your own mind. Bhante, I'm reading chapter five of your second book and the path to insight is a difficult one. Do meditators get more peace gradually or until the final stages? Hmm. I wonder if that sort of means that that chapter five is somewhat depressing. It may be, it may be that I have to go through it and make it clear that this, there's not much you can do really because I mean, you, as you, I'm sure, are aware, there is a lot of deep, dark stuff that you have to go through. And a lot of the stages of knowledge are dealing with that. I mean, it's like when you're cleaning your house. The, the best part of, of cleaning your house is the most dirty part, the most disgusting part, the most revolting and terrible part. Because that's when you're really doing the cleaning. That's the most important part. If you were to avoid that and, and you know, you go in to clean your bathroom, say, and you say, oh, well, that part's too dirty, I'm just going to avoid it. That part's 
too disgusting. Let's just do the parts that are, are, are pleasing, right? Let's just clean those parts of our, of, our, of our toilet that are already clean. It, would, it, would, it wouldn't amount to much, right? It wouldn't, wouldn't accomplish much. It certainly wouldn't accomplish the task. Um, so, I mean, that's partial answer to your question that, uh, yeah, a lot of the peace that we're talking about is really only going to come at the end. Fortunately, that is the end game. That's where we're headed. So you, uh, when you, when you get near the end of the course, not even having finished the course, but as you get to the end of the course, everything starts to clear up almost miraculously. And suddenly you're no longer reacting to things fairly suddenly. I would say it's like stumbling through the forest and then suddenly you break through to a clearing and the whole game changes. Suddenly you're mindful, suddenly you're objective. That's not the end of the course, but that's it's, it, what, it, what it means is you've, you've, you've brought everything together and you've come to gradually to the final realization that, that nothing's worth clinging to. And so you're at this state where you're getting it. And at that point, it's only a matter of time for it to coalesce and, and for there to be enough power to that realization to, to, to make the switch and to suddenly uh, drop your mind out of samsara, enter into Nibbana. Um, so there are two examples of peace and it's probably what chapter six is going to have to talk about. Um, the first one is, uh, it's talked about in, in chapter five, Sankarupeka Jnana, where the mind is equanimous towards all formations. And then there's clarity and peace. It's actually quite comfortable. Uh, but the second one is, is the true peace of freedom. After you experience Nibbana, then there's, there's the sixteenth stage of knowledge. The sixteenth stage of knowledge is the best. Well, it's, it's the one that it's easy to easiest to most memorable as being pleasant, because at that point there's just peace, and you're just walking on walking on egg, no walking on clouds. You're on cloud nine. Uh, you're floating for sometimes days. Everything is at peace. There's no suffering. Well, there's a sense of great peace, profound peace. So yeah, a lot of the true peace really only comes after the course, unfortunately. But again, it's because I mean, we keep challenging. The course is designed to push you. You get good at it? Yeah, let's push you a little further. Push you and push you and push you until finally you I guess you could say snap, but it's not like that. You don't get more wound up. You just become more and more refined. You know? So you've 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 worked out these problems. Well, let's look at the deeper ones. And you look at more and more deeper problems until finally you solve the problem. Bhante, what is your advice on dealing with poor posture while meditating, sitting meditation? I find myself slouching when meditating. Is this common for meditators? When I try to correct the back posture to an upright, straight position, it feels like I'm trying to force it. I get a lot of tension and stiffness when I do, which I know, but it would be better to focus more, but would it be better to focus more on the worrying about the posture than trying to correct it? Yeah, it would be better to focus on the worrying. I mean, if you're not working or doing anything strenuous or stressful, it's quite easy. It's much easier to have good posture when you're meditating. There's much less weighing you down, and your body is in a more relaxed and 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 um, un untaxed state. You know, sort of. You have you have the strength, you have the energy to to stay upright but if you've been working and, and if you've been taxing your body all day um, I wouldn't not, certainly then wouldn't worry about it but even during a meditation course 
um, at least if, you know, if you're just coming out of a life that is stressful, you're going to have a lot of stress during the course, and so it's going to take its toll on your body as well. And so it's not really... They talk a lot about good posture in meditation, but that's for the type of meditation where you can transcend you know, that samatha meditation. If you practice samatha meditation, you can transcend the body and because you put yourself in a single um, focused state, your, your body can, be, can cultivate the strength and the mind cultivates the strength to sit perfectly upright without moving. In, in insight meditation, it's not at all like that. You don't have that. Instead, you're focusing on the ups and downs, the, the vicissitudes, the changes. And uh, so unless you're practicing for days and weeks on end, on end practicing course after course, it's not, it's not really likely that you're going to get good posture in this technique. So I wouldn't worry about it. And in fact, yes, uh, focus more on the worrying. You can slouch like this, your back won't it won't hurt your back as a result. My teacher is when he's now ninety some years old and he always sits slouched. Almost always. Sometimes he sits up, but he's he works really hard and teaches a lot all day, so when he's very old, right? When his posture is fine. As we evolve spiritually are life challenges always in sync with our abilities to deal with them, or are challenges arbitrary, just happening? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know that there's any mechanism by which the challenges we face are proportionate to our ability to deal with them. But you might be on to something in the sense that our perception of reality is going to determine the challenges. We won't even be aware um, or, or we won't even ever deal with. It's not exactly true because, of course, you, know, you can be un, you're unprepared. We're unprepared for so many of our challenges in life. So, I mean, I guess the, the quick answer is no, obviously. I, mean, I don't think it's really very much um, in doubt. Could you say that the people who suffered through the tsunami and died in that tsunami, when was it, 2000? When was it, 14? No, 2007, when was that? It was the big tsunami in Asia. All the people who died and all the horror stories that we heard living in Asia. I was in Thailand at the time. Um, you know, none of them were, that, that wasn't proportionate to people's ability to deal with it. The Khmer Rouge, the Holocaust, all these things, totally out of proportion. And, and that's only the gross examples. I mean, new, a countless number of people have challenges that they are unable to deal with and kill themselves or whatever. Um, but I, I, I wanted to say that there probably is something going on there in the sense that we tend to focus on, like take med a meditation course, for example. You won't even notice the more subtle issues because you're still dealing with the course ones. And so you only deal with what you can. The challenges in, spir in spiritual practice, um, the challenges we face spiritually are probably going to be very much in line with what we can handle. So say someone who's in a tragic situation when they approach it and try to solve it they're only going to try to solve the that which they can comprehend right and that goes i think for meditations that we do focus on the problems and the issues that were best that that were you know that that, that uh res, res, um that uh what's the word Resonate with us. Resonate. Yeah, the question reminds me of a, of a kind of a Christian thing that Christians say yeah. that God won't give you yeah. any more 
and you can handle something something along those lines. What I thought sort of immediately, but such a rubbish argument. Yeah. Silly Christians. <laughs> I have heard that Lao Tzu from the Tao Te Ching may have a particular may have been a Pacheco Buddha. Can you explain the difference between a Pacheco Buddha and an Arahant? Well, they're all Arahants, but we usually use the word Arahant. Um, we mostly use it to talk about people who were unable to realize the teachings, the truths for themselves. Uh, Pacheco Buddha is able to, un to realize the truth for themselves. That's really the biggest difference. And it's considered to be a much more difficult thing, so most people would never have the opportunity to ever become a Pacheka Buddha, but some beings are so well uh, practiced and well um, learned in their uh, wise, let's say, that they're a in their in their uh, the course of their journey in some through samsara, that they're able to realize the teachings without any help. That doesn't mean that they're able to understand them fully. Um, like take an arahant, for example, or a, a sotapanna or so on, they can experience nibbana and not really be able to describe it or explain it or, or even explain how they got there. Um, a particular Buddha is kind of like that, even though they're able to realize it for themselves. Their ability to explain what they realize is uh, is deficient. So there's there is a type of being, a Buddha, that is able to explain perfectly what they've been through. And, and much more than that, it's considered to be able to explain pretty much anything. But a Vicheka Buddha is not able to do that. But they are such a position that they, they just, without any instruction, go off into the forest and become enlightened. Or even living their lives, they become enlightened. Not probably likely as, a, as an ordinary person, but much more likely they would go off as an ascetic and realize the teachings in the forest or something. And then just fade away into Nibbana. I have read your booklet. Is there any way you can do a demonstration of meditation for us to see? Well, there's videos. Um, in fact, I did, which means you probably haven't looked through my YouTube channel. There's a playlist on how to meditate. Maybe someone could even link that here. Bande Arpunya and Kusala, the same thing. Um, well, they're, they're used in two different ways. You could argue that yes, they are, but Kusala is an adjective. Punya is a noun. So punya is a thing. It's a concept. It's a, a category of things. Certain things are punya, which are, means certain acts. So punya would generally refer to kusala um, karma. It would refer to the karma rather than kusala. Kusala is a description of something. So something can be kusala. Um, a pun punya is when you do a good deed that's punya and it's punya because that thing has the quality of being kusala right so if you th if you have a thought a mind state that is associated with kusala jetana jetana or kusala right um or kusala, kusala jetasika sorry kusala jetasika then uh, then it's punya if you have a if you speak um, and the speech is associated or or stems from kusala karma or kusala jeta kusala jetasika then it's um, it's punya and if you act as well but the act the speech the thought those are generally understood to be punya you don't talk about a punya jeta jetasika or something like that punya is a thing it's it's a more conceptual thing. It's more of a sutta teaching, whereas kusala is more of a abhidharma teaching. Abhidharma teaching. 
Sometimes I experience a negative feeling that is difficult to discern what exactly it is. Is it necessary to distinguish what it is or is awareness of the experience enough? Well, not awareness. We would actually want to say feeling, feeling. Use the word to remind yourself. It is what it is. But if it's negative, there's a disliking of, of something. That's what we mean by negative. So I would want you to be a little more specific, at least in terms of saying disliking, disliking. Angry, angry. Angry, even though it may, it may not... You know, we use anger to describe all the negative states. So it does work, either disliking or angry. I think you caught up on all the questions, Bhante. All righty then. Let's stop there. Thank you, everyone. It's great to see our community active. Thanks, Robin, for joining me. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Bhante. Good night. <laughs>